Hello again, everybody. I'm really relieved that we got to show our awards video that time. I was beginning to believe that maybe we'd broken the internet with it or something. But um, so it was lovely to be able to play it properly. I want to welcome you to part three of the World Global Gathering. So this is the last part. And this part is to enable speakers and participants from the Americas to join. But maybe some of the participants from part two are still with us after the break. We can see some of you in the chat, so that's great. This segment is split again, like the others, into the four sessions, Inspiration, Project, Action, and Social. It's the last one of the day, so please enjoy, stay awake, or welcome if you've just woken up. We would love you to get involved in the chat. You've been super active today. Um, ask any questions of our speakers, just use hashtag ask so we can spot them. You can also drop into the info booth to say hello to our world ambassadors for Mexico and Brazil, Magali and Paula. And also, if you can, please get involved in our social media challenge and hold up the sign that was in the PDF uh, that we sent you with a guide to the event. So, on to our last inspiration session. Anne Militello. Light Collective have personally known Anne for around 10 years after meeting her on a workshop in Goa, of all places. And we've always been a little bit in awe of Anne and her amazing lighting career. It spans light art installations, architectural lighting, teaching, and creating stage and concert lighting with some of the most famous playwrights, film directors, and, and musicians you can imagine. And she's talking us to, today from LA about exposure to inspiration. So the last time we saw Anne for real in person was at Light Building in 2018, and she made a comment to us that I'll, I'll always remember. She said that as an older woman, sorry, Anne, um, she, she felt invisible and that some manufacturers had no interest in talking to her. I think after this talk, you will agree that any manufacturer who didn't speak to Anne at that show missed a valuable and a once in a lifetime opportunity. So, Miss, Miss Militello, you are anything but invisible and you are a massive inspiration to us. Thank you. Can you hear me okay now? Am I good? Great. Um, yeah, 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 I'm your fine. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon and Martin and Women in Lighting for having me speak this morning on this International Women's Day. I come to you from Los Angeles, California, where it's first thing in the morning here, so I'm happy to get the day started with you. Um, women are more than half the population of the world, and yet the majority of women aren't given the chance to succeed on a daily basis equally. In light of the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter here in the U.S., we ask for equality and diversity in our field and in our lives. We are privileged, all of us here today, to be here and working in the field of lighting design. Light is a great unifier, and we are all under the same sun, and we are all alive by its radiant energy. Today, we celebrate the female energy. Not only are we life givers, we women in lighting are light givers. We must inspire and support young women as they enter this arena to be able to work freely without boundaries or discrimination and we welcome diversity in our field. My career has been long and fulfilling, and I'm thankful for the kind women and men that have helped me along the way and have supported, supported and nurtured my journey. The road hasn't always been smooth because of my gender, but power and beauty of life has captured my passion and guided my path. I would like to share some of the people and things that have inspired me and request that you always be open to new sources of inspiration to expand your creativity. So I'd like to show you my presentation today. I'm breaking it up into a few segments, introduction, early influences of mine. Why am I asking you to expose yourself? Inspiring women, inspiration equals action, and a challenge to you. Introduction to me. Well, here's some photos of me at work, but I thought it'd be interesting. I am a um, lighting designer, an artist, 
I work in theater, opera, dance, live concerts, nightclubs, television, theme parks. I started my own architectural lighting firm. I'm an artist, a dancer, and I'm a teacher. So various places of my workplace that her work has taken. Um, I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, and I put this here because as a child I was um, always interested. Uh, um, um, sorry to interrupt you. There's something a little bit strange with your microphone. It kind of went in and then went out. Is something rubbing on your mic or something? Possibly. Are you okay? Can I? Is this better? That's good. That's much better. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. No, thank you for telling me. Um, anyway, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and I ushered in the theater as a teenager. And once inside there, I had the um, opportunity to be in this wonderful community where um, there were a lot of theater and concerts. And so I um, decided that I never wanted to leave this world. I loved the world of storytelling and, and theater magic. Um, I went on to grow up and move to San Francisco and then subsequently New York. I got into the music scene and I lit and, um, and hung around in, in different rock clubs and lit lots of musicians and got to fall in love with lighting and music in, in the same vein. Um, in New York, my early influencers, influencers were amazing women and a few amazing men. Um, most notably the playwright, the Cuban playwright, Maria Irene Fornes, that some of you may or may not know. She's um, one of the world's great greatest playwrights. And um, I did many shows with her and she taught me a lot about light. Ellen Stewart was the founder of Off Off Broadway. Um, and she had a theater company called La Mama Theater. And she was amazing and took me right into her stable and taught me a lot as well. Um, John P. Dodd was a lighting designer in New York, and he was also one of the first lighting designers for Off-Off-Broadway and Experimental Theater. Um, he took me under his wing as well, and my pal Sam Shepard, the late Sam Shepard, who some of you may know as an actor, but is a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, who taught me a lot about light as well and was... Um, somebody I collaborated with for many years doing his plays. Johnny Dodd, John P. Dodd, when I was um, first had moved to New York in my early 20s, had decided that I should learn about opera because I didn't know about it. I was working in the music industry. industry. I was working in clubs and lighting bands. Um, and he came over one day and brought me tickets to the opera and said, come with me, we're going to the Met. And I, this was my first exposure to grand theater and grand opera, an amazing spectacle. This is uh, Franco Zaffarelli's um, Tosca that you see here. And I was so awed and, and amazed by it that I decided that I wanted to pursue a bit more of grander theatrical design. Here's another amazing production. I thought this was an appropriate um, slide of A Woman in Light. Um, and this is uh, the um, Ring Cycle by uh, Wagner. So I have a challenge. <laughs> Are you ready to expose yourself? Um, and the reason why I um, chose this topic was that we all should be, or it would be wonderful if we were all open to new ideas in our field. We need to be open to learning new technologies. Um, it would be wonderful if we could always be open to meeting new people, to new visions and a new way of seeing. Um, so here's a definition of expose that I thought maybe I better clarify um, to make something visible by uncovering it to introduce someone to a subject or knowledge, to reveal true nature, to make known and to bring to light and to bring forth from concealment. So that's why I'm asking about exposing. 
Um, here's a quote from Louise Nevelson. Um, My total conscious search in life has been for new seeing, a new image, and new insight. This search not only includes the object, but the in-between place. So I thought that was quite appropriate for today's um, talk about exposure and about inspiration. Here are some amazing women that inspired me in light that you may or may not know of. Um, and I had the pleasure to work or be slightly mentored by some of them, even in the small, in the shortest amount of time, they influenced me greatly. So we have Jennifer Tipton, who is, um, a dance and theater lighting designer here in, um, the United States who is, um, was awarded the MacArthur Genius Grant for her work in dance primarily. Um, Leslie Wheel, who may you may or may not have heard of, um, and she was one of the first pioneers of lighting design and architecture for, for women. She also came from a dance lighting background and transitioned into architecture. Um, to the right is Beverly Emmons, who is an amazing theater designer um, and Broadway and spectacle and opera theatrical designer who mentored me when I was younger, and Marilyn Lowy, who was one of the first female lighting designers in the music industry. There weren't many when she was starting out. There were only two. It was her and Candace Brightman, who uh, worked for the Grateful Dead, who, was, who were very generous to her um, and gave her an opportunity to tour. Marilyn mostly worked with Neil Diamond, and you'll see in this next slide a uh, samples of of all of their work. Whoops, Mot Motoko Ishii got in there because <laughs> she was in there uh, in the first slide. Although I'd never met her, but I was very influenced in her, and somehow that photo disappeared by accident. But as you can see, these women did had great achievements, and their work was spectacular. Other women in lighting that have also influenced me in the uh, fine arts have been um, the California Light and Space Movement artists who you don't usually hear about. You hear about James Terrell, you hear about Robert Irwin. These women were uh, just as prolific in their work and not as well known. Mary Course in her floating um, uh, uh, space work and Helen Pashagian who um, also experimented with materials in light. So these are women you may not have known about. Here's somebody you may or may not have known about as well. So um, Louis Fuller was an American um, born around the turn of the century, uh, lived in the turn of the century, and she was pretty amazing. So um, she was considered really uh, if you want to say lighting designer, she was considered the first lighting designer. I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but she was a friend of um, Madame Curie's, and she, Louis Fuller, had this. Uh, uh, she originally was a dancer and became a choreographer, and she made these um, kind of floating silk wings and silk um, huge veils that she would. Um, dance with, and she also created her own um, a theatrical gel. So she was a, a kind of a physicist as well, and she would um, make concoctions to um, put on glass and put on certain materials and th put lights through them. Um, uh, right when when electric lighting was coming out to light her her pieces, and she also her and Madame Curie worked out some kind of phosphorescent uh, powder that would fluoresce when she danced. So, um, in addition to being an inventor and a creator of her own dance and her own dance moves and her own costumes, she choreographed her own lighting. And so um, she's considered uh, one of the first women in lighting, actually. She was an artist. And she this really took me and inspired me. So um, just a little fun aside, here's Louis Fuller on the left and me on the right, because I also 
um, love to dance and I love to light and I love to um, throw silks around myself. So um, it, it's wonderful to have a role model like that. Albert Einstein um, is quoted as saying, for the rest of my life, I will contemplate what light is. And I have to say that in my life, I still feel like I'm just learning and just on the beginning of really understanding how to work with light and how to craft it. You all have undoubtedly been inspired by light images from nature and um, have emotions around earthly light, heavenly light, uh, celestial light, and this does um, influence us and, and controls us in a way that we may or may not be conscious of. It certainly has taken me to um, greater thought to be able to use natural light as inspiration in my work, and I'll show you some examples of how I've taken inspiration and put it into some of my pieces. Um, here's a star nebula that I used as kind of my impetus when I did a piece, uh, an art uh, installation called Light Cycles that was at the number three World Trade Center in New York City. It was the first um, uh, structure to be rebuilt after the destruction of 9-11. And this was um, a kind of a um, celebratory piece that um, marked the opening of this um, area. And I was using light and thinking about uh, star nebulas and the people whose spirits were had been lifted into another realm. And I was channeling them um, with this light piece. I also was thinking about Aurora Borealis. I used a lot of natural um, inspiration for the colors that I created in this moving light piece. I like to think of others' work. I, I'm always at the art galleries and art museums. I'm a big fan of Mark Rothko. And uh, this is a project that I did in, um, sorry, I'm getting texts through, <laughs> through my screen that I can't seem to turn off. Um, uh, this is a piece from Mark Rothko on the left, and I used his inspiration on this piece in Times Square in New York um, of floating bars, of Rothko bars, through uh, the top of the building. Um, here's a piece of rainbow um, uh, graphite and, uh, and geode, uh, um, sorry, um, diode, geodes, not diodes, um, that is beautiful. I have a piece of this at home, and I've often been inspired by the colors here. And I used um, that as inspiration when I was designing um, a collage of move light, move, moving light for the new, new 42nd Street Studios in New York and Times Square. And here are more images of crystalline diodes that I did on the exterior of this building. More Mark Rothko pieces that also became important to me as I was channeling um, other artists and um, work around uh, uh, this particular piece in New York. I'm also influenced by film noir. I love film noir, and I love the shadowing and the um, kind of charoscuro of that. And so um, here is a comparison to an installation that I did for Prada and Miu Miu for a, um, a launch of a product that they did in, in Hollywood. It was at a home, and so they wanted it very film noir, and I grabbed inspiration from um, movies that I had seen. So I'm connecting inspiration to actual work. Um, a hotel lobby in um, downtown Los Angeles, the historic Mayfair Hotel was restored. And I um, was trying to figure out how to um, put back the glamour that was 
of the 19 Hollywood in the 1940s and the shadows and the and the uplighting and the beauty lighting and so I was able to shape the um, lighting of this hotel to be reminiscent of those times it's another photo of that with lots of shadowing and uplight and and reflected light to make people look glamorous hopefully look glamorous um, this is a James Terrell piece as well, and um, I have long admired James Terrell's work and been inspired by it, and I kind of used as best I could floating um, rectangles in the entrance to a nightclub in Hollywood. Again, I was asked to um, design a concert tour. I'm going to show a few um, of my stage uh, works here, and I designed a concert tour for Katie Lang, the singer Katie Lang, and we were talking about, um, again, the glamour of the uh, 40s and 50s, and uh, I loved the way the light hit curtains, and I in trans trans fired, um, translated this uh, uh, type of feeling to um, a concert um, design that I did for her by kind of um, using the curtains, the very heavily shadowed curtains and um, the Klieg lights of that time. And it was a really fun tour. But as you can see. So um, I also am a longtime collaborator with the artist Tom Waits, the musician Tom Waits. And for um, one of his last tours called Glitter and Doom, he wanted to um, have me um, use inspiration from the Colors of India, where he had just um, taken a few months to travel around. And he was so... Um, uh, inspired by uh, what he had seen in colors. He wanted to bring that to his tour. So, and he wanted the craziness and the chaos and the beauty and the color. So here's uh, one um, slide from that tour. And as you can see, some of the lights are akimbo. Some of them aren't all pointing in the right places. They're a little sloppy and that's what he wanted. He wanted color vibrancy and a bit of, uh, of, of wild light. Um, I also love the work of, uh, the theater artist, Robert Wilson, and, um, he is an avant-garde artist, but he does grand, uh, spectacle, grand shows, and his, he designs, uh, some of his lighting, and other times he works with lighting designers, I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute, and um, I loved the colors in this slide, and I threw it again in the Tom Waits tour. So I'm still in the Tom Waits tour for a second, where it's just rich with different colors of greens and blues. Um, another artist that I find fascinating, even though he wasn't really a lighting artist, but I like to kind of mix my artists sometimes. So Joseph Cornell, who was a collage uh, artist in in the U.S. around the early 1900s, and he put everything in a box. So for that Tom Waits tour, I thought, in addition to the stage, I would move it out a little bit further to make the, the uh, appearance of the stage in a box. So I brought the curtains down and closed in so that the audience felt like they were looking into a magic box. So with the colors from India and with the um, inspiration from a little bit of Robert Wilson and Joseph Cornell, I shaped this particular tour. Um, here's another piece I did um, for uh, the uh, Canadian opera originally. It's moved around to different opera companies around uh, the U.S. and Canada. But again, it's the idea of a Cornell box, of Joseph Cornell's influence on me of looking into a, um, a, a portal and seeing beautiful images with light. For me, that's my interpretation. Um, I also uh, toy around a little bit. <laughs> 
that's an uh, understatement, with um, making my own lighting art, with using theatrical lights as projectors, but not um, modern projectors at all. But I, I use old stage lights. I um, put glass and patterns in them. I put motors in them. And I've been inspired in this case, again, I, I really inspired by celestial light a lot. And so this is a, my interpretation of nebula to the right. Another artist that inspires me is Thomas Wilford, who um, did light pieces called Lumia that were essentially gigantic light boxes that uh, light in its abstract form was able to shape and shift. And they're amazing pieces. If you get a chance to look into Thomas Wilford, he's an amazing artist that also worked in the U.S. in uh, the 40s, around the 40s and 50s, and a little bit onward. He's also not with us anymore. But I used his work to inspire me to do a moving, uh, morphing backdrop that I created out of actually window screen for this band, The Decemberists. Um, and I just loved the abstract quality of the material that helped me kind of move and shift around light, like my um, influence, Thomas Wilford. So there's another Wilford piece to the left, and this is another shot from the December store to the right. So I was creating my own Lumia on a large scale for this band. Um, you know, most of you probably know the work of Oliver Eliasson, and I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, and I love, always loved this image where he's using atmospheres and light. And that influence helped me with uh, a tour. I know this looks a little far-fetched, but there is a unifying um, idea there, I promise. Uh, this is Robert Plant and um, Alison Krauss. Um, a tour uh, several years ago called Raising Sand, and I wanted the background to kind of be able to take to float um, with light, and I couldn't use rain, so I used the next best thing, mar mylar strips, to look like water and rain to move it around. Um, for Leonard Cohen's tour, I wanted it to be um, a bit more... Um, uh, uh, grand and um, classic in a beautiful sense. And so I was channeling classic Greek and Roman architecture to do columns of light um, with Leonard Cohen. So this particular song was the song you might know is Hallelujah, which has become quite a favorite. A lot of people cover it. And it was such an important song. It, it deserved a certain amount of... Um, um, formality and and um, uh, kind of dignity around it, and I also use those same columns as inspiration to shape light a little bit differently for other songs when I was able to um, infuse color into some of the other um, songs. Here's Rothko again, who I love, and. In that same set from the Canadian Opera, I show you um, how Roscoe, again, influenced me as well. Um, and so um, just the red boxes and the, um, the uh, fading out, even though Roscoe was a painter, to, to me, his works were pieces of what were, were representational of light. Um, Caravaggio. Latour, again, the way that they shape light, and I've got a few slides of my work in the theater and how um, the way that I uh, really took in light by painters, early painters, helped me shape um, the, the emotion that light can do in, in uh, a theater piece and express by really... You wouldn't think that this was um, that this was even designed. It just looks like light was thrown on it, but it really I needed to express the desolation of this character. This is Sam Shepard's, um, uh, the late Henry Moss. Um, it, that was um, a piece in San Francisco from the same show. Um, again, just the way. 
that light would seemingly randomly hit walls and um, and coming through empty windows. And this is Sean Penn on the floor about to get knocked by Nick Nolte. A very tense moment in this piece, but um, the light really had to kind of follow the intensity as it, it did with this piece where as lighting designers in theater, we have to represent architecture. We have to resent some. We have to represent somewhat realism, but we have to heighten the emotionality. This is Robert De Niro in a piece on Broadway called "Cuba and His Teddy Bear" that I did um, back in 1986. Here are some inspiring projects that are not mine, but from others that I just wanted to show you towards the end of our little session here. Um, this is a piece by Robert Wilson, and this is uh, lit by John Torres, who's one of my favorite uh, theatrical lighting designers. He's out of New York, but his work with uh, Robert Wilson is amazing. And I am showing this because it is um, architecture, architectural as well, which the whole um, idea of um, integrating theater and architecture and music into one art form. Here's another amazing piece uh, uh, by Robert Wilson with lighting by John Torres. Here is a light artist that you may know, Carlo Bernardini. And um, here's a laser piece of his that I thought reminded me so much of this piece that I saw, or this photograph that I saw in a lighting catalog. And um, just the, how art and architecture and theater is all interlacing these days. And it's kind of wonderful. Here's the artist Dan Flavin um, in his angled fluorescence that he did in the 1960s and 70s. And here's a piece, another uh, a photograph of an architectural installation using those angled uh, long thin lines of light. Another Robert Wilson piece, for, uh, straight lines and a different uh, array. And here is another architectural piece with Light, lines of light just kind of um, almost randomly placed in the ceiling. So I wanted to um, uh, thank you for allowing me to um, give you a presentation, a little bit of my work and what inspired me. And I'm wondering what inspires everybody else. And um, I wonder how is my time, Sharon? My timer went off, and I—it's perfect. It's perfect. I, just, perfect. It's perfect. perfect. <laughs> I couldn't see my screen of what's ahead of me, which is why I was struggling a little bit um, because of the way we had to change my computer. So I wasn't sure where I was. In my yeah, absolutely spot on, and um, I almost feel a bit speechless. You had some really stunning images in there, and quite a few things I've I've never seen before or people I have never heard of. Um, I've got, I can see all the comments in the chat and one of the sort of reoccurring things that people are saying is how lovely it is to see how you'll, you translate your inspirations and ideas into a finished piece. It, the, the story of that really came across there. Um, so we'll see if we have any questions in the chat, um, but uh, I have a couple for you. Um, I was really interesting. I mean, a lot, a lot of people start off um, with with some sort of theatrical background and then move into architecture. I mean, how did that happen for you? I know you still have a foot in both camps, but yes, I do. Um, when I was doing theatre in New York, and I um, would be in the audience at the an opening night and I'd be in the lobby and people would come and meet the artists and I'd meet people that say, I, I loved what you did. Can you light my, can you light my house? And I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. You know, um, what about a store? You know, I, people would come um, and ask me questions about lighting other things. And so I had to learn, I wanted to do it. I thought it was what a great challenge. I wanted to do it and I learned quick and I went down in New York City on the Bowery uh, back in the 80s. There were all these lighting um, warehouses and shops and it was kind of a little, you know, 
rusty and dirty here and there. And I would walk in and um, the, the men in the shop would tell me what to use. I'd say, I need to put lights in the ceiling. And they'd tell me about down lights. After that, I decided I better really learn what it is. And from then on in, I got um, uh, inquiries because of the work on stage that people had seen. So, And then I went to... The other thing I didn't uh, mention, I worked at Walt Disney Imagineering for f four years. I, um, they, um, Disney had come to New York to find theatrical designers to work on um, different Disney parks in Euro Disney Paris. And uh, I was approached. And because I had a little knowledge of architecture from doing these shops and showrooms in New York, um, I decided to, again, take a challenge and take a leap and leave New York and come to California, which was a big deal for me at that time, to um, work for Disney. And uh, they were very generous in, in furthering my education on architectural lighting as I had to combine it with theater lighting to, in order to do their projects. So. And do you, do you have, um, I mean, maybe you don't, maybe you love them equally, but do you have a preference? Because obviously lighting for stage or a concert is something that has a small life um, and is seen by a limited amount of people, whereas obviously doing something for Disney or, you know, a museum or something like that is there for a long time and seen by a larger amount of people. Do you have a preference or do you find them just you know, equally creatively challenging? I think depending on the project, they're challenging because for me, time isn't a factor on on falling in love with a project at all. Whether I, you know, the project, the new 42nd Street studio building in Times Square has been there for 20 years and um, they keep restoring it and, um, and that may be forever. Um, I, uh, uh, one of the most amazing theatrical experiences I had was with filmmaker David Lynch where we did a one night only um, event which to me was one of the most um, um, important creative and exciting things I've ever done so um, I don't think I can't measure it I can't measure it equally and and uh, every time I if I get a really great team of people and a, and really good creative ideas, I've worked a lot with interior designer Kelly Wurstler and some of our um, uh, interior design projects have been amazing and wonderful and fulfilling. So do I have a preference now? <laughs> all that to say. I, I think I used to get frustrated with the putting it all up and taking it all down and putting it all up and taking it down yeah. again. But apart from that... Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Martin. So that's actually similar to a question we normally ask in the Women in Lighting um, interviews. It's from Christina, and it says, "Is there a dream piece or type of work you you wish you'd like to you would like to create but haven't yet had the chance, like a dream project?" Um. Hmm. I, I, um, in particular, so it's interesting because some of the artists that I've always dreamed about working with lighting, like David Bowie are not here anymore. Um, and, um, I think at this point, um, I've done the tops of buildings. I've, you know, I, ah, you know, I'm trying to think what, um, I, I haven't lit, lit a bridge. I would like to light a bridge. So, if anyone's, if anyone's listening, <laughs> I I want to do a bridge. <laughs> almost had a bridge and God, and, and because of COVID and I couldn't go to Canada, mm -hmm. I couldn't <laughs> execute that bridge. So. There will be a bridge in my future, I hope, somewhere. Okay, on the bucket list. Um, there's a question, actually, that Katia has asked that I've got written down as one of my potential questions, so I'll ask it. Um, but it's it's the sort of, what, what would you go back and say to a younger Anne, or what would, advice would you give to somebody who was sort of starting out in lighting today? Right. Um, thank you for that question. I would say to have more confidence in your uh, ideas um, to not take 
not be hurt when somebody rejects your ideas. Just if, if, if they don't like your ideas, it's because they're, they want something else. Keep to what you do and you'll find your match with something else and, and don't give up. And, um, um, as a woman, it's, you have to be strong. You have to fortify your, um, yourself, your psyche, when you get those barbs thrown at you, because you're a woman, I know it still goes on. So you just have to put up that invisible shield and let those bling fling right back off of you and not let them hurt you. Because as women, sometimes our hearts are a little bit more open and we feel a little deeper. And um, it's just a nice wall. Sometimes we have to build so we can continue on with our work and um, not mind the riffraff that's around us that doesn't want us to succeed. Yeah, about keeping, keeping, being confident. Uh, I think it's something, it's easy to look back in retrospect and say, isn't it? But obviously, you know, you, you, it's something you build throughout your life. Uh, a question from uh, Claudia here. Um, well, actually, there's two, but I'll only I'll ask one of them. She's asking about how does collaboration, co collaboration between you and a music, musician work? How much of the vision for a tour or show is created through an exchange, or how much is it an idea you help to realize? Um, I usually, uh, always actually, um, meet with the musicians. Sometimes I'm brought in because they happen to go to another show that they've seen my work and they would like me to create something for them that's unique to them. So I like to sit down with um the musicians and find out the types of things they like or the types of things they don't like. For example, when I worked with Tom Waits, he said, I can't tell you what I want and I can't tell you what I like, but I can tell you what I don't like. And he gave me a list. So I eliminated those, but also for the one tour uh, that I did show for Glitter and Doom, he was inspired by India. But I will sit down. Um, sometimes we um, I sit down with a notebook and I'll sketch as we're talking. So I did that when I, especially when I was working with Lou Reed, uh, the musician. And when he was talking to me, I started drawing some of the ideas that he was talking about. And they became a formation of sketches that we moved onto the stage. But I always involve the musicians. Um, I've rarely met someone that doesn't have a clue at all about what they like or they don't like. They, um, I've been fortunate to work with people. They've, they've chosen me because they want a certain, um, they want somebody who's in tune with their music. And, and, mm. um, you know, I had, uh, I've had fortunately the reputation of someone who understands music, uh, being involved with it so long that I can interpret. Their Did music. you, have you kept all of those sketchbooks? I have. <laughs> I was just thinking there's a project there, there's a book there, Anne, um, for you to publish some of those collaborations <laughs> and sketches. I think there's an audience here, here for that. Um, okay, I'm just going to finish with one question. Um, I don't know if you heard in the introduction, uh, uh, there's three women in the women in lighting community that are starting a history of the women in lighting yes. and looking for sort of nominations or um, women that we might not have heard of and early on in your presentation you named um, a few women um, that I hadn't heard of um, I'd heard of Leslie Wheel but not not the others um, I just wondered I mean why do you think their names are not known you know, why why are they not as well known as uh, you know Howard Branston, for example, and Leslie Will around about the same time. We all know his name, but not hers. Right. Well, it's interesting that we don't hear about Louis Fuller, who was alive at the turn of the century, and so we hear of the very early male lighting designers um, that created environments, and we don't hear about her, and so. Um, I'm not sure. It's the same uh, um, question I have, why we don't know more about Mary Course and Helen Pushagian and the light and space movement. And we do about mm -hmm. them. So um, Jennifer Tipton and Beverly Emmons are theatrical designers, and the world hasn't yet quite 
I, I'm not going to say recognized. Uh, in theater, we're behind the scenes, we're behind the, the, the curtain. And so our, we are not often presented, but the work is so powerful. But personalities aren't presented. And the majority of lighting designers are men, you know, mm-hmm. in the theater. Mm-hmm. The theater is has a better um, uh, balance of men and women. I'm not going to say balance. It has a better percentage of women than in some of the other fields. And I'm thrilled to say that um, in my teaching, I teach at California Institute of the Arts, and I run the lighting program there. And I'm happy to see so many women entering the, entering the lighting field in whatever direction they may go in, in theater or architecture or environmental, immersive environments. And so it's pretty wonderful that that's changing. So hopefully we'll have a better balance. Well, all the people that were listening today have now all heard of Louis Fuller. And if you could see the comments, um, that was a real hit with everyone. Uh, <laughs> I think we'll all be investigating that. Um, we're going to finish. We've run out of time. Well, that'd be lovely to talk to you all night. Um, well, we've got some other presentations to get on to. So thank you, Anne. I hope we can see you sometime soon. Yes, thank you, Sharon. When things open up, we'll be flying all over the place working again. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.